behind it 20 years after the fact. The Aldrich bill was condemned in the platform. When Woodrow Wilson was nominated, the men who ruled the Democratic Party promised the people that if they were returned to power, there would be no central bank established here while they held the reins of government. Thirteen months later, that promise was broken. And the Wilson administration, under the tutelage of those sinister Wall Street figures who stood behind Colonel House, established here in our free country the worm-eaten, monarchical institution of the King's Bank to control us from the top downward and to shackle us from the cradle to the grave. Once Wilson was elected, Morgan, Warburg, Baruch, and company advanced a new plan, which Warburg named the Federal Reserve System. The Democratic leadership hailed the new bill, called the Glass-Owen Bill, as something radically different from the Aldrich Bill. But in fact, the bill was virtually identical in every important detail. In fact, so vehement were the Democratic denials of similarity that Paul Warburg, the father of both bills, had to step in to reassure his paid friends in Congress that the two bills were virtually identical. Brushing aside the external differences affecting the shells, we find the kernels of the two systems very closely resembling and related to one another. But that admission was for private consumption only. Publicly, the money trust trotted out Senator Aldrich and Frank Vanderlip, the president of Rockefeller's National City Bank of New York and one of the Jekyll Island Seven, to oppose the new Federal Reserve System. Years later, however, Vanderlip admitted in the Saturday Evening Post that the two measures were virtually identical. Although the Aldrich Federal Reserve Plan was defeated when it bore the name Aldrich, nevertheless, its essential points were all contained in the plan that finally was adopted. As Congress neared a vote, they called Ohio attorney Alfred Crozier to testify. Crozier noted the similarities between the Aldrich bill and the Glass-Owen bill. The bill grants just what Wall Street and the big banks for 25 years have been striving for, private instead of public control of currency. It the Glass-Owen bill does this as completely as the Aldrich bill. Both measures rob the government and the people of all effective control over the public's money and vest in the banks exclusively the dangerous power to make money among the people scarce or plenty. During the debate on the measure, senators complained that the big banks were using their financial muscle to influence the outcome. There are bankers in this country who are enemies of the public welfare, said one senator. What an understatement. Despite the charges of deceit and corruption, the bill was finally snuck through the Senate on December 22, 1913, after most senators had left town for the holidays, after having been assured by the leadership that nothing would be done until long after the Christmas recess. On the day the bill was passed, Congressman Lindbergh, prophetically warned his countrymen that this act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government by the monetary power will be legalized. The people may not know it immediately, but the day of reckoning is only a few years removed. The worst legislative crime of the ages is perpetrated by this banking bill. On top of all this, only weeks earlier, Congress had finally passed a bill legalizing income tax. Why was the income tax law important? Because bankers finally had in place a system which would run up a virtually unlimited federal debt. How would the interest on this debt be repaid, never mind the principal? Remember, a privately owned central bank creates the principal out of nothing. The federal government was small then. Up to then, it had subsisted merely on tariffs and excise taxes. No, just as with the Bank of England, the interest payments had to be guaranteed by direct taxation of the people. The money changers knew that if they had to rely on contributions from the states, eventually the individual state legislatures would revolt and either refuse to pay the interest on their own money or at least bring political pressure to bear to keep the debt small.
It is interesting to note that in 1895, the Supreme Court had found a similar income tax law to be unconstitutional. The Supreme Court even found a corporate income tax law unconstitutional in 1909. As a result, Senator Aldrich hustled a bill for a constitutional amendment allowing income tax through the Congress. The proposed 16th Amendment to the Constitution was then sent to the state legislatures for approval. But some critics claim that the 16th Amendment was never ratified by the necessary three-quarters of the states. In other words, the 16th Amendment may not be legal. But the money changers were in no mood to debate the fine points. By October of 1913, Senator Aldrich had hustled the income tax bill through Congress. Without the power to tax the people directly and bypass the states, the Federal Reserve Bill would be far less useful to those who wanted to drive America deeply into their debt. A year after the passage of the Federal Reserve Bill, Congressman Lindbergh explained how the Fed created what we have come to call the business cycle and how they use it to their advantage. To cause high prices, all the Federal Reserve Board will do will be to lower the rediscount rate, producing an expansion of credit and a rising stock market. Then, when businessmen are adjusted to these conditions, it can check prosperity in mid-career by arbitrarily raising the rate of interest. It can cause the pendulum of a rising and falling market to swing gently back and forth by slight changes in the discount rate, or cause violent fluctuations by a greater rate variation. And in either case, it will possess inside information as to financial conditions and advanced knowledge of the coming change, either up or down. This is the strangest, most dangerous advantage ever placed in the hands of a special privileged class by any government that ever existed. The system is private, conducted for the sole purpose of obtaining the greatest possible profits from the use of other people's money. They know in advance when to create panics to their advantage. They also know when to stop panic. Inflation and deflation work equally well for them when they control finance. Congressman Lindbergh was correct on all points. What he didn't realize was that most European nations had already fallen prey to the central bankers decades or centuries earlier. But he also mentions the interesting fact that only one year later, the Fed had cornered the market in gold. This is how he put it, quote, already the Federal Reserve Banks have cornered the gold and gold certificates, close quote. But Congressman Lindbergh was not the only critic of the Fed. Congressman Lewis McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee from 1920 to 1931, remarked that the Federal Reserve Act brought about a super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. Notice how McFadden saw the international character of the stockholders of the Federal Reserve. Another chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee in the 1960s, Wright Patman from Texas, put it this way. In the United States today, we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government. Then we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System, operating the money powers, which are reserved to Congress by the Constitution. Even the inventor of the electric light, Thomas Edison, joined the fray in criticizing the system of the Federal Reserve. If our nation can issue a dollar bond, it can issue a dollar bill. The element that makes the bond good makes the bill good also. The difference between the bond and the bill is the bond lets money brokers collect twice the amount of the bond and an additional 20%, whereas the currency pays nobody but those who contribute directly in some useful way. It is absurd to say that our country can issue $30 million in bonds and not $30 million in currency. Both are promises to pay, but one promise fattens the usurers and the other helps the people. Three years after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, even President Wilson began to have second thoughts about what had been unleashed during his first term in office.
We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled governments in the civilized world, no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by a vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Before his death in 1924, President Wilson realized the full extent of the damage he had done to America when he confessed, I have unwittingly ruined my government. So finally, the money changers, those who profit by manipulating the amount of money in circulation, had their privately owned central bank installed again in America. The major newspapers, which they also owned, hailed passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, telling the public that now depressions could be scientifically prevented. The fact of the matter was that now depressions could be scientifically created. Power was now centralized to a tremendous extent. Now it was time for a war, a really big war. In fact, the first world war. Of course, to the central bankers, the political issues of war don't matter nearly as much as the profit potential, and nothing creates debts like warfare. England was the best example at that time. During the 119-year period between the founding of the Bank of England and Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, England had been at war for 56 years, and much of the remaining time she'd been preparing for war. In World War I, the German Rothschilds loaned money to the Germans, the British Rothschilds loaned money to the British, and the French Rothschilds loaned money to the French. In America, J.P. Morgan was the sales agent for war materials to both the British and the French. In fact, six months into the war, Morgan became the largest consumer on earth, spending $10 million a day. His offices here at 23 Wall Street were mobbed by brokers and salesmen trying to cut a deal. In fact, it got so bad that the bank had to post guards at every door and at the partners' homes as well. Many other New York bankers made out as well from the war. President Wilson appointed Bernard Baruch to head the War Industries Board. According to historian James Perloff, both Baruch and the Rockefellers profited by some $200 million during the war. But profits were not the only motive. There was also revenge. The money changers never forgave the czars for their support of Lincoln during the Civil War. Also, Russia was the last major European nation to refuse to give in to the privately owned central bank scheme. Three years after World War I broke out, the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar and installed the scourge of communism. Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb and Company bragged from his deathbed that he had spent $20 million towards the defeat of the Tsar. Money was funneled from England to support the revolution as well. Why would some of the richest men in the world financially back communism, the system that was openly vowing to destroy the so-called capitalism that made them wealthy? Researcher Gary Allen explained it this way. If one understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super-rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately, socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. As W. Cleon Skousen put it in his 1970 book, The Naked Capitalist, Power from any source tends to create an appetite for additional power. It was almost inevitable that the super-rich would one day aspire to control not only their own wealth, but the wealth of the whole world. To achieve this, 
they were perfectly willing to feed the ambitions of the power-hungry political conspirators who were committed to the overthrow of all existing governments and the establishments of a central worldwide dictatorship. But what if these revolutionaries get out of control and try to seize power from the super-rich? After all, it was Mao Tse-Tung who in 1938 stated his position concerning power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Wall Street, London Axis elected to take the risk. The master planners attempted to control revolutionary communist groups by feeding them vast quantities of money when they obeyed and contracting their money supply or even financing their opposition if they got out of control. Lenin began to understand that although he was the absolute dictator of the new Soviet Union, he was not pulling the financial strings. Someone else was silently in control. The state does not function as we desired. The car does not obey. A man is at the wheel and seems to lead it but the car does not drive in the desired direction. It moves as another force wishes. Who is behind it? Representative Lewis T. McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee throughout the 1920s and into the Great Depression years of the 1930s, explained it this way. The course of Russian history has indeed been greatly affected by the operations of international bankers. The Soviet government has been given United States Treasury funds by the Federal Reserve Board, acting through the Chase Bank. England has drawn money from us through the Federal Reserve Banks and has relent it at high rates of interest to the Soviet government. The Dnieper Satori Dam was built with funds unlawfully taken from the United States Treasury by the corrupt and dishonest Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. In other words, the Fed and the Bank of England at the behest of the international bankers who controlled them, were creating a monster, one which would fuel seven decades of unprecedented communist revolution, warfare, and most importantly, debt. In case you think there's some chance that the money changers got communism going and then lost control, in 1992, the Washington Times reported that Russian President Boris Yeltsin was upset that most of the incoming foreign aid was being siphoned off, quote, straight back into the coffers of Western banks in debt service, close quote. No one in his right mind would claim that a war as large as World War I had a single cause. Wars are complex things with many causative factors. But on the other hand, it would also be equally foolish to ignore as a prime cause of World War I those who would profit the most from the war. The role of the money changers is no wild conspiracy theory. They had a motive, a short-ranged, self-serving motive, as well as a long-ranged political motive of advancing totalitarian governments with the money changers maintaining the financial clout to control whatever politician might emerge as the leader. Next, we'll see what the money changers' ultimate political goal is for the world. Shortly after World War I, the overall political agenda of the money changers began to be clear. Now that they controlled national economies individually, the next step was the ultimate form of consolidation, world government. The new world government proposal was given top priority at the Paris Peace Conference after World War I. It was called the League of Nations. But much to the surprise of Paul Warburg and Bernard Baruch, who attended the peace conference with President Wilson, the world was not yet ready to dissolve national boundaries. Nationalism still beats strong in the human breast. For example, Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Secretary, called the League of Nations a good joke, even though it was the stated policy of the British government to support it. To the humiliation of President Wilson, the U.S. Congress wouldn't ratify the League either despite the fact that it had been ratified by many other nations without money flowing from the u.s treasury the league died after world war one the american public had grown tired of the internationalist policies of democrat woodrow wilson in the presidential election of nineteen twenty 
Republican Warren Harding won a landslide victory with over 60% of the vote. Harding was an ardent foe of both Bolshevism and the League of Nations. His election, which opened a 12-year run of Republican presidents in the White House, led to an unprecedented era of prosperity known as the Roaring Twenties. Despite the fact that the war had brought America a debt ten times larger than its Civil War debt, still the American economy surged. Gold had poured into the country during the war, and it continued to do so afterwards. In the early 1920s, the governor of this bank, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a man named Benjamin Strong, met frequently with the secretive and eccentric governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman. Norman was determined to replace the gold England had lost to the U.S. during World War I and return the Bank of England to its former position of dominance in world finance. On top of that, rich with gold, the American economy might get out of control again, just like it had done after the Civil War. During the next eight years, under the presidencies of Harding and Coolidge, the huge federal debt built up during World War I was cut by 38 percent down to 16 billion dollars the greatest percentage drop in u.s. history during the election of 1920 warren harding and calvin coolidge ran against james cox the governor of ohio and the little known franklin d roosevelt who had previously risen to no higher post than president wilson's assistant secretary of the navy after his inauguration, Harding moved quickly to formally kill the League of Nations. Then he quickly moved to reduce domestic taxes while raising tariffs to record heights. Now this was a revenue policy of which most of the founding fathers would certainly have approved. His second year in office, Harding took ill on a train trip in the West and suddenly died. Although no autopsy was performed, the cause was said to be either pneumonia or food poisoning. When Coolidge took over, he continued Harding's domestic economic policy of high tariffs on imports while cutting income taxes. As a result, the economy grew at such a rate that net revenue still increased. Now that had to be stopped. So just as they'd done so frequently before, the money changers decided it was time to crash the American economy. The Federal Reserve began flooding the country with money. They increased the money supply by 62% during these years. Money was plentiful. This is why it was known as the Roaring Twenties. Before his death in 1919, former President Teddy Roosevelt warned the American people what was going on. As reported in the March 27, 1922 edition of the New York Times, Roosevelt said, These international bankers and Rockefeller Standard Oil interests control the majority of newspapers and the columns of these papers to club into submission or drive out of public office officials who refuse to do the bidding of the powerful corrupt cliques which compose the invisible government. Just one day before in the New York Times, the mayor of New York, John Hyland, quoted Roosevelt and blasted those he saw as taking control of America, its political machinery, and its press. The warning of Theodore Roosevelt has much timeliness today, for the real menace of our republic is this invisible government which, like a giant octopus, sprawls its slimy length over city, state, and nation. It seizes in its long and powerful tentacles our executive officers, our legislative bodies, our schools, our courts, our newspapers, and every agency created for the public protection. To depart from mere generalizations, let me say that at the head of this octopus are the Rockefeller Standard Oil interest and a small group of powerful banking houses generally referred to as the international bankers. The little coterie of powerful international bankers virtually run the United States government for their own selfish purposes. They practically control both parties, write political platforms, make cat's paws of party leaders, use the leading men of private organizations, and resort to every device to place a nomination for high public office, only such candidates as will be amenable to the dictates of corrupt big business.
These international bankers and Rockefeller Standard Oil interests control the majority of newspapers and magazines in this country. Why didn't people listen to such strong warnings and demand that Congress reverse its 1913 passage of the Federal Reserve Act? Because remember, it was the 1920s. A steady increase in bank loans contributed to a rising market. In other words, just as it is today, in times of prosperity, no one wants to worry about economic issues. But there was a dark side to all this prosperity. Businesses expanded and became strung out on credit. Speculation in the booming stock market became rampant. Although everything looked rosy, it was a castle made of sand. When all was in readiness in April of 1929, Paul Warburg, the father of the Federal Reserve, sent out a secret advisory warning his friends that a collapse and nationwide depression was certain. In August of 1929, the Fed began to tighten money. It is not a coincidence that the biographies of all the Wall Street giants of that era, John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, Bernard Baruch, etc., all marvel that they got out of the stock market just before the crash and put all their assets in cash or gold. On October 24, 1929, the big New York bankers called in their 24-hour broker call loans. This meant that both stockbrokers and customers had to dump their stocks on the market to cover their loans, no matter what price they had to sell them for. As a result, the market tumbled, and that day was known as Black Thursday. According to John Kenneth Galbraith, writing in The Great Crash, 1929, at the height of the selling frenzy, Bernard Baruch brought Winston Churchill into the visitor's gallery of the New York Stock Exchange here to witness the panic and impress him with his power over the wild events down on the floor. Congressman Lewis McFadden, chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency from 1920 to 1931, knew who to blame. He accused the Fed and the international bankers of orchestrating the crash. It was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here so that they might emerge as rulers of us all. But McFadden went even farther. He openly accused them of causing the crash in order to steal America's gold. In February 1931, in the midst of the Depression, he put it this way. I think it can hardly be disputed that the statesmen and financiers of Europe are ready to take almost any means to reacquire rapidly the gold stock which Europe lost to America as the result of World War I. Curtis Dahl, a broker for Lehman Brothers, was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange the day of the crash. In his 1970 book, FDR, My Exploited Father-in-Law, he explained that the crash was triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York money market. Actually, it was the calculated shearing of the public by the world money powers triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York money market. Within a few weeks, three billion dollars of wealth simply seemed to vanish. Within a year, forty billion dollars had been lost. But did it really disappear? Or was it simply consolidated in fewer hands? And what did the Federal Reserve do? Instead of moving to help the economy out by quickly lowering interest rates to stimulate the economy, the Fed continued to brutally contract the money supply further, deepening the depression. Between 1929 and 1933, the Fed reduced the money supply by an additional 33 percent. Although most Americans have never heard that the Fed was the cause of the depression, this is well known among top economists. Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist now of Stanford University, said the same thing in a national public radio interview in January of 1996. The Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one-third from 1929 to 1933. But the money lost by most Americans during the Depression didn't just vanish. 
it was just redistributed into the hands of those who had gotten out just before the crash and had purchased gold, which is always a safe place to put your money.